All right, well, others may come, but let's let's just start with a word of prayer to our God, okay? Let's bow our heads, close our eyes, and put the snow out of our minds for a moment. Heavenly Father, um, we gathered together in your name, and uh, uh, we're worshiping you, and uh, we're trying to learn more about you. We're trying to uh, just talk amongst ourselves about you based on not our own speculations, but based upon your word to us, your revelation of who you are. So Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit be with us. Uh, we know that uh, the Spirit resides within each of us who know your Son as Lord and Savior. But uh, we ask you to just fill us up. I was going to say fill the room, but uh, uh, fill the, the room of, uh, of virtual contact that, uh, that we now have so that we can delve as deeply as we can, as deeply as possible into what you reveal about yourself. And in doing so, we learn more about who we are as your adopted sons and daughters. We pray these things, Father God, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, last week we were talking about a great length. I was doing too much of the talking. I'd like more of you to, to do some of the talking. But we were, we were speaking at length about well, how do we know anything about God? And um, uh, the answer that I was pressing, pressing is that we can all, by using our reason from general revelation, just looking at the world and looking at its complexity, looking in at our own bodies and seeing its complexity, seeing how, how this could not just be an accident, we can all, everyone can figure out uh, that there must be some supreme being uh, out of uh, whom came all of this, that something just doesn't come out of nothing. Uh, and that can get you at least to believe and agree with scripture that only the fool, hi Debbie, that only, that only the fool in his heart can say there is no God. But is that, is that where we stop? Of, of course not. We, we know God a lot more because we, and if we stop there with general revelation, we will know that there is a God. We will be able to figure out a few things about this God, perhaps, but we will not know that much about God. So how do we learn about the God that we, you, all of us, worship? Bible. The Bible. You got it. God's word tells us he's revealed himself to us. And his words on those pages in the Bible are what we call the word of God. And that word of God, those words written down by a whole bunch of different people, each with their own style, each with their own personality and uh, injected into that writing. Nevertheless, each one of them is inspired by God, the Holy Spirit. Each one of them has those words, God breathed. So while the styles may change, the personalities may be in there, may, uh, while everything is culturally uh, informed to some extent, historically informed to some extent, all of it is informed ultimately by the God breathing of the Holy Spirit, which means we're talking about God revealing himself through these inspired writers. So it's the Bible. Now the Bible, are the, is the word of God. These are the words of God written by these uh, inspired uh, authors. And they attest to the living word of God. And the living word of God is not words on a page, but Jesus. Jesus Christ, right? Jesus Christ, who is, who, if, you, if you want to see the <clears throat> Father, as Moses wanted to see the Father in his full glory, Kavut, as he wanted that, and, and God said, no one can see the face of God and live, put him into a cleft, and he only saw him as he was passing by. Yet we get to see the Father, not in his full glory, but how he made it possible for us to see, to see him through, and the Greek word is exegesis, which is what you do when you're in <coughs> scripture. And that exegesis is, once again, a person. Jesus. Jesus yeah. Christ. So, so that's where we are. So which brings me back to the, 
the main thrust of this. And some people can, some people have different approaches. They believe that you achieve faith uh, by understanding more and more. And through understanding, you you seek faith. Uh, I totally disagree with that. I, I believe that revelation sets us apart from any pagan or, or mystery religion or animism or anything you want to, to throw up as an example, because we start with faith. Our knowledge of God is faith seeking understanding, not the other way around. So that's where we left off um, with the idea that, uh, ooh, uh, let me just see my notes here. Yes, faith seeking understanding, not the other way around. Not only should there, must there be when we're engaging in theology, which is God talk, not only must there be a total stress on scripture, but there must also be a total stress on worship that we as a community should not even begin God talk unless it's in the context of who we are as believers. And what do we do as believers? We worship the almighty. What else do we do as believers? Anybody? We have a relationship with Jesus. Amen. We get to, we get to worship our God by not just abstraction or thinking about God or even even just by meditating on on say the Old Testament scriptures which pointed to the coming of the Christ we have a personal relationship with the Christ himself with Jesus and by that way we enter into a pathway with God himself because as we all know and as we said last week when Christ was crucified what what was torn apart from top to bottom well, the, the curtain, veil. The veil. That's veil. Right. The curtain, the veil that separated the Holy of Holies where God was present from us people. From and, us. The only one, and who can go in? Who can go into the Holy of Holies once a year? The high, the high priest. The high priest, right? The high priest alone could be the one to go in there and represent all of God's people. So much so that no one else could, though. They even put a rope around him in case the high priest dies. But that veil has now been torn from top to bottom. We can go in there because we have our high priest already. And his name is? Jesus. Nice. So it all comes down to Jesus. And I would argue, and hopefully, I think, since we start with the premise that God, knowledge of God is not pure and objective knowledge uh, out there somewhere in an abstraction it is not balancing opinions about god or making making nice philosophical and speculative and metaphysical statements about god uh, so then how do we learn about god we you all you've already said through the bible through scripture so I want to argue, and uh, argue is not even strong enough a word, I want to contend that that Bible tells us that part of faith is the only way that we can see these words on that page to be God's words. And that is always part, I would argue, of worshiping God. So somebody tell me what you think worshiping god is all about in your words because i'm tired of hearing my my voice <laughs> what does it mean to worship god and there are no wrong answers well no no we take of course there's some wrong <laughs> answers but, but no one at the middle is going to give us a wrong answer so what does it mean when you say i i worship god or even the word worship what do you what's what does it mean <sighs> We all well, <clears throat> sorry. To put, it, to put it one way, you could say giving him the credit that he deserves. Very nice. Very which, nice. You know, yes. it's not it's a crude way, but you oh, know no, I mean? it's a very good way because okay. worship comes from um the word with it really means worth shit. So you're right on target, giving to someone the worth that, that person is entitled. Uh, so when you say 
Valentine's Day just mm -hmm. as many people go out of their way and they say, oh, I adore you. I, how many times have you looked at little babies? What an adorable little baby. And that happens to be true. Has anyone ever seen a, <laughs> a non-adorable little baby? Absolutely not. So, so adorable is a word used, but we kind of shy away from the word, I worship you. But if you think of it, I give you worth. Why do you think we, we Christians, we followers of Jesus, don't use that? We use words like, I adore you. I love you little bits here. You're my, my best friend, blah, blah, blah. But why do we avoid saying to another human being, I worship you? What are we afraid? Because they'll, it will go to their head. Well, that's true. <laughs> Yeah, and, and if you do it, what we <laughs> that certainly will go to their head. And if you're the one doing it, what are you maybe potentially possibly falling into the trap of doing? Making an worshiping idol. the wrong person, yeah. making an idol, right? An idol, yeah. idolatry, idolatry. Now we hear a lot about idolatry, uh, especially in the Old Testament, right? Right? Can, can you give me, uh, old or new, can you give me some ideas from your own reading in the word of what you've seen idolatry to be? The golden calf worship. Say again. Oh, gosh. Yeah. I didn't hear you. The worship of the, I'm sorry, worship of the golden calf. That's right. Right? Remember, Moses was up doing, what was he doing? What was Moses doing? Getting the ten Getting, Yeah. God was giving them the law, Mount Sinai. And when he came down, what were they doing? They were worshiping a calf that they had molded out of gold, the golden calf. Uh, someone just joined us. Hi, Rosemary. Hi, Pastor Jim. How are you? Hi. I'm good. Good. good thank you. you. So thank you. we're talking idolatry. So the golden calf is perhaps one of the one of the great examples in the Old Testament about idolatry. What are other examples that you can think of? It's in the Old and in the New Testament uh, of I idolatry. Nioko just had a great one. What are others? Um, hmm. Trying to think. The, uh, the, the kings, the rulers, the rulers of the, of the um, different Worship me, Try. worship me, right? Yeah. Bring, yeah, uh, bring all your things. Okay, what else? Well, when Jesus started his ministry, he went into the desert, and, and right, and uh, sometimes it's translated as he was sent into the desert. The actual word is closer to he was thrown into the desert. He was ejected into the desert. Um, the Holy Spirit <laughs> ejected threw him into the desert, and he went through a long time of temptation. What was the devil? What were some of those? Well, there were three, right? What were the, some of those temptations by Satan that he was trying to win Jesus over to doing? Possession of lands and countries and that sort of thing, just, you know, possession of things. And all you have to do to get that was what? Worship. Worship, worship him. him. That's right. Worship him worship him and well now a lot of us we all we're all very sophisticated right in our 21st century oh my goodness these are these are just things that people people don't make golden calves anymore and people don't worship the devil oh, really oh really well is that, do any of you um, you don't have to answer this but did any of you ever in your life worship idols yes uh -huh. <laughs> each one everybody just throw out not everybody but if you want to throw out an idol that you might have worshipped because I had a few so uh, my job my job yeah you become you <clears throat> worship your work your work and what does that entail too with not only worshipping your work what people think of you right yeah, yeah. we we put that on the very we find our meaning in that don't we huh? reputation yeah. reputation what else a new car. The, a new car. Possessions. Is that what you said? A new car? Yeah. Oh, that's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have a friend. He gets a new car. He's, he always leases them, but he gets a new one every two years because he said he likes the smell of the new car. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, yep. Possession. That. What about money? I was just going to say money. 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 Yep. money. Big one. <clears throat> is money the root of all evil? Is it? No. Or? No. No, um, it's the love of it's money. It's the love of money. That's right. There's nothing wrong with getting cars. There's nothing wrong with falling in love with uh, with someone. Uh, there's nothing wrong with saying you're, these, these babies are adorable. There's nothing wrong with wanting to do a really good job and to have and to please the people whom you're working with and working for. There's nothing wrong with obtaining money, but there is something wrong when that becomes your focus, when that becomes the thing you love most dearly. One theologian called it, your ultimate concern should not be the things of this world. The minute you make your ultimate concern about anything in this world, you've mm -hmm. kicked God off of the throne and replaced God with that thing. Now, what mm -hmm. else? Okay, give me, uh, expand a little bit. What other... Um, what other things constitute idolatry? Because I'm the belief that's a that's <clears throat> I'm a little loose with words sometimes, so I don't take this as my central theological belief. But I do believe that I, if there were one central sin that we humans are most allergic to <laughs> or are most inclined to do, it's idolatry. So, but uh, what is? What does idolatry come down to in one sense? It's the worship of the anything, no. anything that we put before the Lord. That's right. And if we anything that we put before Him, because when we worship Him, we are recognizing that He's sovereign over our lives. So Amen. as sovereign, that means that He comes first, and everything else comes afterward. So oh. anything, at any time that idolatry occurs, is when there's like a misplaced uh, of of order where those things act. Actually, go before him. So that could be you, anything. Like, you said like, it very it was well. like education, like obtaining a law degree, like uh -huh. it could be anything, and that's horrible. Uh, well, I uh, I remember thinking, oh gee, idolatry. You know, that's just something in the Old Testament by very ancient peoples, or or maybe if you go to Alaska, you see totem poles, right? And all the no, totem poles are things that are carved out of wood as opposed to golden calves, as opposed to bronze, faces, pictures of demons, of gods and goddesses. Well, I used to worship totem pole. I had a big totem pole. Every one of the faces on my totem pole looked just like me. That's what I worshiped. I worshiped myself. And I would argue that that's the biggest temptation we have. That's what Satan wants us to do. Very seldom are you going to see it does happen very seldom you're going to people see people who know there's a devil and therefore know there's a god oh i'm going to worship satan and uh, because i want to go into hell very seldom but you will see people who don't realize that it's a, not okay to worship yourself because mm -hmm. when you worship yourself the yoga just said you're inverting the whole scheme of things you're putting yourself first. You're pushing God off of that throne and making him, no, making him number two, maybe number three, whatever fits your fancy. Politics, another, by that I don't just mean the kind of politics we practice here in America, although that can be idolatrous. It was for me because when I was a politician, but what I mean by that, think of the 20th century. On the left, you had communism. On the right, you had fascism and Nazism. These were ideologies that people followed that gave meaning to their lives. Instead of saying, there's a wonderful story in a book I read about a, a, a town in, in central France and they resisted Hitler. And when the representative of the, uh, the, uh, the puppet government in Southern France representing the Nazis came, he would say, Heil Hitler. And they were French, so so viva Hitler. And they yelled out nothing. And they waited, and then they all yelled together, Viva la Jesus Christ, Jesu Christi. Jesus is the one we hail. Not hail Hitler, not hail man, not hail anybody. Not even hail Mary, as much as that poor woman Mary has been put down 
into, into something she never wanted to be and turned into an idol. Hail Mary was a simply way of, of saying, and it comes from the Bible, greetings, Mary. Guess what? You're going to be the mother of Jesus of Nazareth. But that has been turned into idolatry. And so many things have. I believe another thing that can become idolatry sounds self-contradictory. It's religion. Religion can become idolatrous. Works. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Anybody, I don't, I'm not religious. At least sometimes I am, but oh, I try to fight it up. And it, why do I say that? Well, I, I think that people who look at religion as something where you have to do all kinds of works, that can become, you know, you can kind of start idling that. Like how many times can you do this? Or how many, how many checks can you tick off the box? you know, because that makes you so much better and, and that sort of thing. So I think that people who are, who feel that they're very religious because they do all the right things, that that becomes an idol to them too. And I guess it's, they're being idealistic about themselves, but they use religion to do it. Does that make sense? Well, let me play devil's advocate. I have no agree with what you said, but let me play the opposite. This is not what I really think, but I'm gonna I'm gonna argue. Mm -hmm. After all, I was a lawyer, and that's what they do. They'd argue all kinds of things. Talk about idolaters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the devil's advocate that I am. What's wrong with that? What's wrong? Life is sad and lonely, especially during this stinking pandemic. A religion is a good thing. You get together, you get to do things, you have an order of worship, you have a liturgy. Uh well, not in that. Brookdale Church, where you don't even call them sacraments, but in other churches, you call them, you have sacraments, you, you get there's a lot of nice music, and, and there's preaching, and there's all kinds of things. Isn't that what religion is? We've spent, we spent thousands of years, we human beings, building up that religion, right? 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 Hmm. What's wrong with what I just said? Why would that possibly be idolatrous? Potentially, potentially. Well, that, that won't get you to heaven. Purpose, yeah. What do you mean? I'm the, well, I'm a good person. What if I do good works? What, what if I, if I, by going to church uh, and, and, and I go to communion, don't I get grace and doesn't that help me uh, do good things and God's not gonna keep me up? I'm not a Nazi or a communist. I, I'm a good person. Why would God keep me out of heaven? That's religion. And I'm a good religious person. So tell me why that's bad. What did I say that was just because really stupid? Almost, <laughs> almost all of the sentences that you were saying was I, I, I. Yes, ma'am. I am good. I did, I did this. It is, it is not a worshiping situation that mm. you're describing. Right, instead of worshiping the one who said, I am the great I am, I'm worshiping this I, me, myself, myself. And one of the commandments is do not make graven images. Do not worship graven images. That's not necessarily totem poles made from wood. That's not necessarily uh, uh, golden calves or any kinds of, uh, of sculpture, beautiful wood sculptures like in the Easter Islands, things like that. That's idolatry. Out now, that's paganism. But so that's what happens to us when those faces are us and that we worship ourselves. That is idolatry. That is our graven image. And there's so much in our culture, it's all about I, isn't it? It's all about the self. It's all about selfishness. And to some extent, we're all individualistic, right? But Jesus taught, did he not, that if you spend so much time, and he wants us to love ourselves because we're children of the Father, right? But if you spend so much time loving yourself, you're not going to have any room left over, are you, to love other people? And he wants us to love other people. Goodness gracious, he even wants us to love our enemies. I've always, I've always, always joked a few times from the pulpit, the two 
uh, most difficult scriptures for us to obey in our century in the New Testament are the first one I think about is the parable of the workers who come. Some come early and work a full day and then some come late, but the very last hour and they get the same wage as the people who came first. Ah, what's going on? That's not fair. That's not fair. Once we had some kids, to, uh, well, we used to have kids services in the middle of our service and whoever answered the best questions came up front. And so this one kid was magnificent. He was right in the front. And then we handed out gifts and we started at the back and he got really upset. So do we, don't we? How dare someone get ahead of us? They only came at the end of the day. I've been doing, I, I, I've been doing all these works because isn't it hard to realize that we, it doesn't matter. We can't earn this gift of salvation, mm -hmm. right? Right. And, and I think the other really, well, maybe let me stop talking. What's another hard one for us to uh, put our heads around in scripture? That we, for, for us, particularly in America, I think. Well, what you just said about loving your enemies. Yeah, I think that's amazing. I don't know about you. I have, I have a hard enough time on my own. I could, I have a, on my own, I have a hard enough time loving people that I don't, I'm neutral about, but loving my enemies, I grew up to hate my enemies. Isn't that right? Aren't we supposed to hate our enemies, destroy them? But Jesus said, no, it's, it's, you've inverted it. You've switched it around. Just like Naoka said, you can't, no, you're supposed to love your enemies. Ah, ah, who can do that? I cannot do that on my own. And I doubt any of you can. What but did Jesus do? What, if we look at scripture, what did Jesus do? He Think about what he did. What was, what was one of his last words on the cross? I mentioned it in my sermon yesterday. I mean, on Sunday. He said, forgive, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Yeah. So he was praying for his enemies right. while he was dying. Yep. And in the middle, as they had just crucified him, if in a horrible way, he prayed for them. Do we do that? We try. We sometimes do, but I don't think any of us can do that on our own because that's not who we are. That's not who we are. I have a very good friend. He's very left wing. And he, um, he said, I can't love. I can't love people on the other side because they have oppressed my people. They have oppressed uh, through their systems. They have made, they have made my, my people miserable. And I can't possibly understand how to love them and i have another friend on the right who said my first friend's name is joe i i can't stand joe anymore all he is talks about is is politics politics i don't know how i can love him well since those conversations they both have come to christ and they're not so extreme in their views anymore and they both love each other now we all we all know we celebrate uh, his birthday, uh, they all, uh, the country rallies around him on both sides. I'm talking about Martin Luther King Jr. I happen to think, you know where the civil rights movement started? It started among Baptist churches in the South. Martin Luther King Jr. was a theologian. He was a God talker. And what he taught was about the beloved community, community, he said, he talked about it was all of us being sons and daughters of the Lord. And together we will love each other. My gosh, is that just an ideal? It's not politics. That's Christianity. That's what we're all about. And anything less than that is idolatry. Idolatry. Now, we have some beautiful examples that I wrote down of uh, idolatry. They're not my ideas at all. Um, and every Christian, every culture uh, has their own. And by the way, one of the things I, I love about our relationship, not our religion, is that if you ever look at Christian art in the various cultures, Jesus, thank God there was no photography, Jesus is depicted as the people look in that culture. The Japanese Christ is depicted in Japanese Christian art as Japanese. The Pacific Islander Christ is depicted as the people, the Christian people in that culture. 
a specific islander because Jesus is our brother. He is everything. He transcends everything. What did he look like? I guess he probably looked like uh, someone who lives in uh, Palestine today. You know, he probably, I know he didn't have blonde hair, blue eyes, right? He was, he was Semitic, right? He was dark. He was very dark, brown, perhaps black. And his hair was probably curlier than mine. So this was a person, and the Bible was clear to say that there was nothing about him that would make people look at him because of the way he looked. They looked at him because of who he was. Our culture is very caught up, is it not, in the way others look, in the way we look, in the way we present ourselves, in the way we look before the mirror dimly, right? So this is idolatry on so many different levels. Some of the symbols that are used. Um, for example, our church has many uses of symbols. We have the symbol of the cross. Do we not? To remind us of what Jesus does. When we, when we celebrate communion, uh, we're not thinking about some kind of uh, human being with magic fingers making some kind of magical change in the elements of the bread and the cup. No, we're, we're put in mind of the cross. How come we don't have a crucifix? I grew up in a church that had crucifixes when I was a kid. How come we don't have that? Because that can be an idol as well. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, they focus on the actual cross as opposed to looking at Jesus uh, or having a relationship with him. They think that if they wear the cross around their neck, that shows how close they are to the Lord, but it, it's that in itself can become an idol. Some people pray to their crosses. Some people rub their crosses for good luck. These are yeah. things that can turn these, yeah. these, these yeah. are objects. Yeah. Yep. All right. It's, not, it's not the complete story. <laughs> it's not the complete story. Okay, because he's risen. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Okay. Who else? Two good answers. I was going to say that, that he's no longer on the cross. He's no longer on the cross. That's, 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 that's a different answer. That's actually a different answer. It's a third answer. And he said, now, having grown up in a religion that had something called the mass, every celebrated every day, if you cared to go, the mass was a re, an attempt to recreate. In fact, we were taught as little kids that the mass meant that Christ would be crucified over and over and over again with each celebration of that worship service called the Mass. And no, he's off that cross. It was done once and for all. We can participate in its effects, but he is off that cross and he is risen and he is alive. And we, he does not have to die again and again. We participate in his cross by being in union with him, not by having him crucified over and over again. Another form, if I dare say, a mild form of idolatry. Uh, some kinds of uh, the celebration of communion is, is seen, uh, can become idolatrous. Uh, Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, Martin Luther and a guy named Zwingli, those two reformers, had vicious arguments about whether the bread and the cup represents the real uh, body of, and blood of Christ. That does, is there a transformation? Luther, whom I love in many ways, was still very much a medieval monk. And he thought, well, no, the, the elements don't change, but Jesus is really there inside and upside and downside at all. Whereas Zwingli, someone nobody remembers, was like our celebration that it's a beautiful symbol and it's called memorialist, that it, it, we remember Christ's sacrifice every time we drink the cup and eat the bread. Uh, it's not that we are eating his, his body and drinking his blood. We are remembering that he gave his body and his blood for us. You can take that, you can take anything good and push it to the extreme and make it an idol. Um, other symbols in the, in, the, uh, in the Bible, we see symbols of clouds and smoke 
and flames, right? We talked last week, did we, about, about the flames, the burning bush. The burning bush, it was fire. What a beautiful symbol. Something you can't possess, but you can, you can put onto something and hold it. Something that brings beautiful light where before there was darkness, something that brings heat and protection, but something that if you don't deal with it with the necessary awe can make, make you into a Holocaust. What is symbol where God appeared in the fire that did not quench and spoke to Moses out of that fire? Fire used again when? We talked Pentecost. About yeah, say again? Pentecost. Pentecost, that's right. Where the uh, their heads caught on fire, right? The, I mean, one of the symbols of the Holy Spirit is the flame of fire, along with the symbol of wind. And my favorite is the Celtic Christianity, which has died out, but it was the early uh, the Dark Ages, if you will, the late Roman Celtic Christians uh, believed another symbol of the Holy Spirit is the goose, the wild goose. And... Um, we, want, we may laugh at that. I am the love geese. Uh, there's not, since I was a little kid, hearing geese flying off, you know, somewhere else, uh, and that noise they made, and it was turning uh, winter. And if you notice, it, it, they're in formations, and there's a leader. And when the leader gets tired, the leader withdraws, and another leader takes place. And so this was, and the wild goose chase it became, well, this was a, a symbol for that culture that long ago. Uh, are these idolatries? No, because they didn't worship geese. We don't worship doves. We don't worship flames. But these are symbols to enrich our understanding because we're limited human beings and God gives us these symbols so we can better understand him. So the flames, the smoke, the clouds, the fire, they preserve the mystery of God. And the word I used intentionally last week, God's incomprehensibility. Oh, what do you mean? What do you mean, Jim, is incomprehensible? Of course, he's, co he's comprehensible. We have the Bible. What I mean by that is we will never in this life know God in his fullness, in his glory, in his kavut, using the Hebrew word. We will never know him the way Moses wanted to know him, but we will know enough about him because he gave us Jesus who entered into his creation, right? So when we talk about worship, we're talking about not just worshiping God, but the Bible tells us how to worship God. Jesus tells us how to worship God, doesn't he? Anybody want to want to riff on that a little bit? Talk about worship. We, like in our in our church, we walk in. We have an order of service. People, some people said, "You people have no liturgy." Well, no, we don't have in the old traditional <laughs> sense. But we do have an order. We have music. We have prayer. We have preaching, and uh, occasionally, once a month, we take communion together. Like it or not, that's a liturgy. It's not like you walk in and you just follow the guidance of whatever you think you whatever you think the Holy Spirit is doing. Why is there some kind of order of service? Why does why do we think that that's a good thing rather than walking in and everyone kind of ad living? <coughs> I mean, it's funny to see Pastor. Love I think it. Well, I I think it sh I think it shows respect. In honor and fear of God. To what have order. It and what's it say about our God? That our God is not a God of ad libs. He is a God yeah. of order. He is a God of order, but not stratified, stultifying human order that just makes you into straitjackets because he's also the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the God of wind who comes and goes where he wants. But the only way we can even deal with that is within the realm of order. God ordered the world. And what did the Holy Spirit, what, what is the first appearance of the Holy Spirit in the Bible? Well, Genesis. Genesis. And what was the whole, what was the Spirit doing? Hovered he over was, the, yeah. hovered over the over earth. what? Earth. And what part of it was it? Just the good, the, 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 the chaos. 
He turned the chaos into order. Yes, he can come and go as you please. These things are incomprehensible beyond us. Well, because we're born with flesh and we had a beginning and he was eternal. But God, the spirit, ordered this universe for us so that we could live in it and get to know him more. Hmm? Yep. So these symbols are rich and good and they don't make us idolaters. But if pushed to our, with our egoism to the extremes, of course, we too, we too could, could ask about, uh, we could ask about anything and make it good into bad, simply by pushing it again and again beyond something we don't know what we're talking about. Now, I wanna ask you a question. I used the word sacrament before, and we use the word ordinance. And an ordinance, we know what an ordinance is. Anybody here ever get a ticket? Oh, you're not going to answer that. You don't have to. I have even gotten, yes, I have gotten a ticket. Even after I was saved, I've gotten a ticket. I confess I'm a sinner. <laughs> saved sinner, though. <coughs> an ordinance is what? Someone define an ordinance for me. The law. The law, a rule. A falling. What's it come from? What's the what's it come from? Order. The verb it comes from ordain. If I were if if the king ordains something, it happens. God ordains something, and that's something we are commanded to follow. How would that be different? Now, a sacrament. Let me tell you. When I was a little kid, I was uh, an altar boy, and we had to go <laughs> catechisms. The sacrament was defined this way: an outward sign instituted by Christ signifying signifying God's grace take communion eating bread drinking the cup an outward sign instituted by Christ right do we even use his words of institution don't we this is my body this is my blood signifying signifying God's grace I'm, I'm, I'm down with that with that definition. The problem, that's a good definition. We don't call it sacrament because it has, over the course of many centuries called the Middle Ages, perverted that definition and became all about making it into something earthly and too bodily. And I'm not trying to be cruel to my Catholic friends, making it something that just is not what was intended. It's supposed to signify God's grace, not a transmission of God's grace. There's a difference. An outward sign instituted by Christ transmitting his grace, because that's what I was taught. I was taught wrongly, I believe, because unbiblically, that the cross was as important. If we evangelicals claim that, say, Eastern Orthodox or Roman Catholics don't don't need the cross. They don't say they don't need the cross. That's not true. They believe the cross alone provides grace. But here's the difference. The grace that is given to them is in part sanctifying grace. And that sanctifying grace, which is gotten from the cross of Jesus, the cross and the resurrection, the Jesus event, into them upon their acceptance, that enables them to do good. Well, we believe that. But that enabling, of empowering of them to do good is part of their participation in gaining their salvation. It's part of their justification before God. The grace helps you do good. But when you commit a certain kind of sin, they call mortal sin, you lose it. It's like your gas tank goes empty, so you got to fill it up again. You go to confession and you get more grace through the sacrament cycle, like communion. The difference is not just a subtle one. We believe it is not a transmission of grace, but that when we know, when we proclaim Jesus to be our Lord and Savior, we receive all kind, we receive the grace that saves us, and we are saved and declared righteous by Father God. But then we can participate in doing sanctifying works, which don't save us. We've already been saved by the blood of the lamb, but then gives evidence that we have been saved. So again, it takes the, it takes the emphasis 
off of what Carol said when I was trying to play devil's advocate. I, I, I. It's not about me. I cannot earn my salvation on my own. I cannot love my enemies on my own. But when I accept Jesus Christ, pure gift of grace in his sacrifice for me, I am then saved. I am then justified by Father God who declares me <laughs> righteous. I'm not righteous, but I, Christ's righteousness is imputed to me. And then after that, I can work out that salvation I've already gotten through sanctification because now I can love. Now I can do good. Now I can do sacrificial love. I might even be able at times to love my enemies. And that's a big difference. It's not just a minor distinction. It's a big difference. And that's why we call ourselves evangelicals. And we're in many denominations, some Baptists, some Reformed, some uh, many different, all over the place. Some don't call themselves anything. They're just Christians. And what it means is that we live according to the Evangelium. And the Evangelium is the word of God. We live according to the Bible, and the Bible directs us. And that means, yes, we can do good works. We need to good, do good works. We need to show evidence that we've been saved, but the good works won't save us. There'll be evidence of being saved. Amen? Amen. Yes. So Amen. <clears throat> what about pictures of God? Is it bad? Now, the Eastern Church in the 800s, the Eastern Church had this big uh, argument between iconoclast and iconodules and the iconodules i wrote down what they believed in they said no oh, well, i'll get to it uh well i'll give you an example i'll give you an example there are plenty of people john of damascus was the leading one he said it was important <clears throat> that the reality of the human nature of christ be set forth in these icons and uh Christ should be depicted in these icons because people are too weak to figure out on their own that the nature of Christ, that what we what needs to be done, since they didn't have photography then, is we need to create photos uh, which didn't exist of paintings, icons, and that that would depict God. Now, the controversy was that is idolatry, and the other people were saying, no, it's not people, it's just stupid. And we need stupid people need these pictures to get them to understand. A lot of them at that time couldn't read or write. So you get stained glass, which told the stories. What do you think? What do you come down on things like that? Or do you think we've passed those kinds of issues? <laughs> Well, I think things like that make thing makes God like personal for us in a sense. You know what I mean? Like, you know, they talk about the hand of God and all that. God doesn't have hands. I mean, if we think about it, God doesn't have hands because he's spirit, right? But it helps us to understand a little bit about God, to, to get a little, you know, something that we can get. You know what I mean? Under That's all. I don't know. Uh, and that's called a symbol. Of course, God doesn't. The eyes of God. Of course, God doesn't have those kinds. Of, that's human beings projecting onto our Lord. But his son took upon himself flesh and he had those hands. But yeah. you're right. When we talk about the hands of God, we're talking sometimes about God the Father. Or some people think the Holy Spirit really is a dove. or really is fire. Right? Or it may even they might have thought he was a goose. But, but those are symbols. So idolatry comes in when you take the symbol and you turn it up. And the symbol is by definition something human, right? As Bob said, so that we could better understand attributes of God that are beyond us. So we put it into our, our um, what? Inadequate human words. So we have these inadequate human words and we have these symbols but then don't we human beings so often like to take these things and conform them to our own human beliefs, our own self, put them into our categories. And that's where the idolatry comes in. When I, when I first became a Christian, 
and I, uh, I, uh, I, you get very zealous. You get a little obnoxious. And we have, we have behind our baptis baptistry stained glass. And I once told the, the pastor at the time, I'd like to throw a rock through that baptistry. That is just idolatrous and awful. It's a stained glass. I don't feel that way anymore. But I do think that kind of stuff can become idolatrous if you're not careful. Because what you need at a service is not depictions of Jesus on the cross because he's no longer there. You don't need crucifixes which can become idolatrous you need preaching and teaching about the crucifixion you need the word of god exposed you need preachers not to talk about themselves another form of uh human symbolism that can go all wrong through egoism you seen any of these tv evangelists some of them are good but some of them that's all they talk about is themselves the preacher is supposed to move out of the way and not, he can tell some anecdotes about himself maybe to get the point across. The preacher is supposed to move aside and let the word of God comes through so it's Christ who is presented. And when that preacher takes upon himself where it's a, a festival about him, well, then you've got idolatry. And when that happens, you got to fire that preacher. <laughs> you got to rise up because that's not a, any longer a person of God who is projecting. It's, uh, I don't want to mention, I shouldn't mention any names and I won't, but there is a preacher. There is a preacher around and it's all part of the prosperity gospel. And that's a preaching of idolatry of the worst kind. He, I heard him say, Jesus died on the cross so you could be rich. <clears throat> you think, you think the Lord would, recognize those words there are all kinds of things though, but this somebody talks so i can stop putting my foot in my mouth before i say something <laughs> mean about somebody and i don't want to do that my point is simple even good things like symbols can become not so good things in our human hands our fallible hands our sinful hands but if we're not humble about even about the things we use, knowing that these are symbolic words and pictures and images that we use not to worship the image, not to worship the, the negative uh, from the photograph, but to know that they point to something that we can't fully understand. So we use our human language, our symbolic language to even understand what the Bible says, hmm? right? Sometimes I preached on of uh, uh, First Corinthians of uh, thirteen <coughs> the last two Sundays. Clang did we become clanging, clanging, <laughs> uh, 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 noisy gongs and clanging cymbals? Literally, no, no, of course not. Those are symbols to try to uh, symbolically project through human words that when we don't have love in our lives, agape love, God's love. Go, true love of other people which we can't do on our own that when we don't have that we become like noise we become without substance so the beautiful language of poetry is used by paul what's more noisy than a, a gong or a cymbal if it's not surrounded by the other music right so what we need in that other music is you and me together we're a community and we, when we take communion, we are come unioning with God. We're unified with Christ. And we do that together. Yes, he saves us one-on-one. -on -one. He comes to us one-on-one. -on -one. We as individuals are the ones who open up our arms to receive Christ. But we live in a community, do we not? We are individually members of the body of Christ. And what did Paul say in, in his writings? He compared it to what? In chapter 12, what did he compare it to? He compared it to what? The human body. He oh. said, we're all part of the same body. Individually, you, you may be an ear. You may be a foot. You may be an eye. But you think you think the ear or the foot alone can, can function? 
No, we are saved individually and we have individual gifts and individual, and that individualism will never be, be shred, but we're part of a community of love, not just love for our God that unites us to our Christ, but love for each other, which I will argue until they put me in the ground is not an easy thing to do because there must be times, my friends, are there not? when you don't even really like yourself. And you're certainly gonna be times when even people you love to bits just get on your nerves or you get on theirs. And so mm -hmm. this kind of love can't happen by our willing it, you know, or by pretty songs and great movies that bring tears to our eyes. This can happen only through the love that comes from God. And what does first John four tell us? God is is love. love he is love all right i want to talk about what time is it anybody oh my gosh about eight o'clock okay all right i won't go long i talked more than i wanted to i apologize next week i want you somebody to give me give me one of these all right um and horace isn't here he usually puts a nice uh he puts a rattle he puts a the stick to me sometimes um uh, i want to talk about the trinity and so we'll do that next week. We're talking about fundamentals. Before we do, and don't be afraid, because it's not an easy thing. Just leave us with first thoughts. When I say God is Trinity or God is triune, what are some of the first thoughts that come to your mind? God in three persons. God in three persons. Amen. What else? You can use analogies if you want. Who are those beautiful little children there I just saw? Uh, they sneaked in and out. <laughs> those are the kids. They're, they're going upstairs to sleep. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to mute. My okay. <laughs> okay, other name, other, other thoughts. Trinity. What's Father, that? Son, and Holy Ghost. <laughs> Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. What else? Keep talking. Throw them out. Throw the name. Throw, throw what you're thinking of. Well, you know what, and I'm not trying to identify them, I guess. I, when I think of that, I kind of feel guilty for myself in a way because I have my favorite. <laughs> you know, but, but I don't know if it's right to say favorite or not. It's just like, if I think of who is it that I want to think of that I'm going to and I'm talking to, I will admit that I always think of going to my Jesus. Okay. And sometimes I feel guilty about that thinking, you know, I mean, the, the, I don't know. I don't know if it had explained well, it. Let me, let, me, let me make you feel better. The Holy Spirit who indwells you, mm -hmm. believer, is re often referred to as the Holy Spirit of Christ. Right. So when you're going to your Jesus, you go, who is the Holy Spirit? It's the one that he left behind for us, mm -hmm. right? I know right. that they're all the same. I guess it's just that I think I don't always envision myself going to the Holy Spirit. I envision myself going before my God, before Christ. I don't even think of myself going before my God. I just don't envision that. I know that it's the same. Well, we don't believe in purgatory, so we are not going to. We're not going to say anything. Well, I know. I know. <laughs> I guess I just all right. Who else? More. The Trinity. Well, I think you know they use examples like the uh, three-leaf clover. Yep. Yeah. St. Patrick, right? Three yeah. of uh, the, the, uh, the What's yeah. the other word for that? It's called it's not it's clover. It's shamrock. Uh, shamrock. Yeah. Is it shamrock? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. That's good. Three, right? And yeah. What else? What's another symbol that you've heard? It's modalism. You know what modalism is? Modalism is when you if I say, well, God is like water, steam, and ice. That's modalism, because because what that means is it's only one person, but it appears to us in different guys. For example, I'm only one person, but my essence is also unitary. Uh, but when I appear in the mode of a father to my children, they see me as their father. When I appear to some people in our congregation as a pastor, they see me as pastor. To my friends, they see me, but I'm one and the same person. I'm a unitary being, one person, one substance, but different modes. 
The Trinity is more than that. The Trinity is saying one substance, one being, three separate persons within that one being, within that one substance. So that's what we're going to talk about a little bit next week. And it's varieties and it's heresies. And it may be one of the <laughs> hardest things for us human beings to put our heads around, our finite heads, because it is this is a mystery that goes beyond our brain power, goes beyond our experiences. Yeah. We might have seen shamrocks and we might have seen ice and fire. We might have said one that I heard is also inadequate, but it's a nice one. It's that God the Father is the lover. God the Son is the beloved. And God the Holy Spirit is that love which surrounds all three. Sounds really beautiful. Uh, I didn't invent it, some theologian did. Sounds really beautiful, but even that isn't adequate enough, is it? Because again, it's symbolic. So I'd like you to think about the Trinity and uh, look in the Bible. By the way, is the word Trinity in the Bible? Can anybody tell me what book it's in? No, because it's not there. It's not, so what do you mean? If it's not, I thought this was going to be about biblical theology and the word's not there. There you go talking about something speculative. There's no word Trinity in the Bible. Well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that next week because it's all over the place from the beginning of creation to right now. So I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I wanted to stop at eight, but that's all right. We're only 8.05. So anybody want to say anything before we adjourn till next week? I'm Monica, I want to say thank you very much. Well, thank uh, you. It's a blessing. It's really a blessing to start knowing more about the Lord. Thank what? you very much and blessing to everyone. Thank you, Pastor Jim. You too. Oh, oh, bless you. Bless you, Monica. That's wonderful. You, Monica. We're glad to have you here. Yeah. And... Uh, Tell people to come. It's not painful. Then they hear people hear the word theology. They think, ah, this is going to be just academic stuff. It's about our Bible. It's, that's what it's about. And the more we know about, the more I can learn. I'm learning it. How many times have you read scriptures and you've read them over and over? You've read them before. And then you find, you read them, for, say, for the seventh time and you find something brand new that yeah. you never thought of. And I think that's the Holy Spirit at work in us. Spirit of Christ. Okay. Who will close us in prayer? <clears throat> uh, I will. Okay. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time that we had. We thank you, Lord, for your speaking through Pastor Jim, Lord. We thank you for his study and his preparation to um, expose your word to us and, and to reveal more of you to us, Lord. And I just pray for all those who are gathered here, Lord. I pray for their families, keep them safe, keep them healthy. And bring us all back next week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I bless you all. Be safe. It's dangerous out there. Thank you. Okay. I know that. Bye. 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 Bye.